All right, everyone, I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Christian Jorgensen, and I'm an IHL legal advisor at the American Red Cross National Headquarters. Uh, the American Red Cross primary mission with regards to international humanitarian law is to educate the public through our IHL dissemination program. The American Red Cross IHL dissemination program through the efforts of our volunteer instructors works to educate the American public on specifics and issues related to international humanitarian law, which is also referred to as the law of armed conflict. Today, I wanna to thank you for joining us to discuss international humanitarian law and its relationship to COVID-19. Today's presentation will be led by Professor Ona Hathaway. Ona Hathaway is the Gerard C. and Bernice Latrobe Smith Professor of International Law at Yale Law School, Profe Professor of International Law and Area Studies at the Yale University Macmillan Center, Professor of the Yale University Department of Political Science, and Director of the Yale Law Good School job. Center for Global Legal Challenges. So with that, I will pass it over to Professor Ona Hathaway. Thank you again, Professor, for joining us. Thank you so much, Christian, for having me. Um, and thanks to everyone for your interest in this topic. I'm really thrilled to get a chance to, to speak with you all today. Um, so I'm gonna um, uh, share a screen um, because it's sort of helpful, I think, to um, give you a kind of overview of the topic uh, using some PowerPoint slides. Um, and then I look forward to hearing all of your questions so we can talk through um, these sometimes complex issues. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about today, oh, sorry, wrong slides. I need to pull up a different set of slides, my apologies. Um, uh, I have a presentation at CFR uh, on Friday and I put up the wrong slides. Um, so let me share the correct slides here. Um, it's not a problem. Stop my share. Um, uh, here we go. Uh, is it showing the right set of slides? Is it showing COVID-19? Right oh. now, I just... Uh, no, nope. no, okay, sorry. Now, now there we go. Oh, no, it was right. Okay, there we go. All right, so let me just start that again. All right, sorry about that. My apologies. There's too many, too many, too many talks and too many topics. All right, so, um, what I want to talk to you about today is um, COVID 19 international law. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on international humanitarian law, but I wanted to put this slide up here because um, I think what got the ICRC's attention was a series um, of short papers that I did with a set of students on applying international law to um, the pandemic and thinking through all the ways in which the pandemic triggers different bodies of international law. Um, and one of those areas is international humanitarian law, but it's not the only one. So if you're interested in sort of digging in a little bit deeper um, into these topics, you might look at this series the COVID-19 and international law series on just security. Um, and then we've turned it into an article, um, which is also posted on SSRN on COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic and international law, where we go through a number of different areas of international law. So again, international humanitarian law is one of them, but not the only one. And I know many of you are interested in IHL, um, but you may be interested in other bodies of law as well. So as I mentioned, we did international humanitarian law. We also talk about international human rights law. I'm happy to speak to that. I, my slides won't cover that. My presentation today won't cover it, but if you have questions about it, I'm happy to cover it. We also talk in the piece about immigration and refugee law and the way in which the pandemic um, affects these bodies of law. Um, cyber law, there's been a number of incidents, at least there were early on incidents about um, seeking to disrupt vaccine distribution and potentially seeking information about um, uh, vaccine development um, and transportation, as well as disinformation campaigns around uh, the vaccine. So we deal with some of that um, in the piece. And then we look at international hum uh, health regulations um, that are part of the WHO's structuring documents um, and maybe some potential reforms to those international health, health regulations to try and address some of the problems that have been exposed in the pandemic. So this is just to put the presentation today into broader context. International humanitarian law is really one of a key area that has um, been affected by uh, the pandemic. And there's ways in which um, we need to be thinking more deeply about our obligations under international humanitarian law, everybody's obligations under international humanitarian law in light of the changes that have been brought about by the pandemic. But it's not the only body of international law that has been affected by the pandemic. And I just wanted to kind of put that on the table so you all see this in broader context. Okay, so 
first um, body of law of international humanitarian law um, that has been affected by, um, by the pandemic is conduct of hostilities. So conduct of hostilities really is around this question of what can you do in the course of um, hostilities? How is your conduct in the course of hostilities affected um, by uh, the pandemic? And the, the articles are, are uh, extensive, so I'm not going to go through the full detail, but the key um, points that we make um, are that first, um, parties of the conflict are not supposed to target military personnel or um, personnel who are um, or to combat because of the virus. Um, so um, uh, the, they're, uh, certainly if somebody is um, a military, a combatant who is sick um, from COVID-19, um, they are considered or to combat, particularly obviously if they if they are sick enough to not be able to um, fight and therefore cannot be um, targeted. Belligerents are also not uh, to punish medical personnel, um, disseminating uh, personal protective information, um, such as masks, carrying out COVID-19 tests or administering a vaccine. So um, this is important for um, ensuring that um, medical personnel who are working with military forces um, are not um, targeted or punished um, for assisting with COVID-19 response. Um, and, and as I said, testing, providing um, protective devices or providing treatment, or now that the vaccine is available, um, providing the vaccine to um, belligerents on either side. Um, and um, one of the most interesting and I think important um, uh, elements of conduct of hostilities that is affected by the pandemic is assessing the question of proportionality of attacks and undertaking precautionary measures to ensure that parties take into account foreseeable pandemic related, what are sometimes referred to as reverberating effects of a military operation. And these are, as I note here, secondary impacts on civilian objects and infrastructure. So um, for instance, if you take out a medical facility that not only um, is itself a violation of IHL, but the broader impact that that might have on leading to a further spread of the pandemic of making it more difficult to address um, those uh, to assist those who have been harmed, maybe um, uh, having an impact on dissemination of the vaccine or other PPD, those are reverberating effects that may further impact the proportionality analysis of a targeting decision. So if you're making a targeting decision, you understand that it might have an impact on civilian infrastructure. If that civilian infrastructure is being used in addressing the pandemic um, in some way, um, that, that um, is part of the reverberating effects and might lead, might require a belligerent to um, give greater weight to the um, harm that would be done and therefore be less likely to take a strike that might have an impact um, on the ability to address COVID-19 and its spread. So that's conduct of hostilities. That's one body of law um, that belligerents should be bearing in mind in the course of, um, in the course of uh, taking operations in the middle of a pandemic. Um, second body of law is humanitarian access. Um, this is maybe the most extensive area. We had, we had a lot to say here. Um, humanitarian personnel have to be respected and protected, of course, um, as, must, as must any object of humanitarian relief operations. Um, so if, if um, there are medical personnel transporting COVID-19 related equipment, um, face masks, vaccines, um, other kinds of PPD, um, you have a duty to respect and protect that equipment. Civilians um, in particular have to be, uh, cannot be denied access to essential COVID-19 prevention materials. And certainly there can't be um, a restricted develop, uh, uh, dissemination, for instance, of PPD or of vaccines to certain civilians as a punishment, um, for instance, as we're beginning to hear some word of that coming out of some conflict zones. Um, warring parties um, also must treat those who've contracted COVID-19 in light of their obligation to take care of the sick and, and wounded. Obviously somebody with COVID-19 is um, sick. Um, and so they have to provide access to COVID-19 prevention materials for civilians who are sick or wounded and protect them from further harm. That's among the obligations that, um, that attend to belligerents in a conflict under international humanitarian law. 
Um, also under um, uh, humanitarian access, um, aid organizations such as the ICRC, our sponsor today, have the right to offer aid in both international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict contexts. So um, uh, belligerents don't necessarily have to accept the offer of aid, but if they themselves cannot address the humanitarian need, then, um, then they do have to accept the aid. So effectively, belligerents are permitted to reject the aid, but only if they are able to meet the minimum needs um, of the populations that are under their control. So in the current crisis, aid organizations might be better positioned and equipped than the parties to provide COVID-19 related aid to civilians and prisoners of war, for instance. Um, and as I said, that's subject to consent of the parties, but they can't deny consent unless they can themselves provide the necessary aid. Um, so aid organizations offering PPD, masks, other kinds of essential equipment, ventilators, oxygen, um, and again, vaccines now are such an important part of the um, effort to address the pandemic. Um, uh, the, they have to be allowed access unless a party can provide it themselves. Um, they can prescribe some technical arrangements for distribution of COVID-19 supplies so they can have some rules about when and how it's disseminated. Um, uh, and um, they can sort of supervise the delivery of that humanitarian aid. But again, they can't discriminate against civilians of a rival party or uh, discriminate against particular groups in the dissemination of the aid or in permitting humanitarian access to groups like the ICRC. Um, and then another area um, of international humanitarian law that um, we address in our work is treatment of detainees. Um, as um, those of you who are lawyers, I'm sure know um, there's, and in the article, we sort of differentiate more fully between international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict. It, when it comes to detainees, that's where the differences are, are more stark than they other, are in the other areas. So first, for international armed conflict, and, and I will preface this by saying this is not so much an issue today. There aren't many um, detainees in IACs these days, um, uh, but just to sort of get it out on the table, um, the rules are pretty extensive for detainees in an international armed conflict that is a conflict between two states. And so if a state is holding a member of the armed forces of the other state, they're a prisoner of war and they're entitled to certain um, ex pretty extensive protections. Um, and among those protections are, you know, basic sanitary procedures, level of goods and infrastructure in the camp. Um, the detaining power has to take an effort to try and prevent an epidemic. Um, so that means providing PPE, um, again, face masks, other kinds of um, uh, sanitary measures to try and address the spread of COVID-19, ensuring um, that there's not overcrowding of detention facilities, that there's room for adequate social distancing, that they have to provide for medical inspections, so they have to provide some for um, testing to ensure um, that COVID-19 is not running rampant within facilities. Um, civilian internees who manifest symptoms of COVID-19 have to be quarantined um, in an isolation ward and provided adequate medical treatment. Um, and again, ICRC and other aid organizations can offer humanitarian relief and detaining powers have to accept it unless they can themselves meet the health needs of detainees. More relevant to today um, is detainees in non-international armed conflicts. Um, and this is actually one area that um, we've, we've really seen difficulties during the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, detainees are um, entitled to medical examinations, proper treatment, and basic, basic standard of health and, and hygiene. If they're infected with COVID-19, they're entitled to appropriate medical care to the greatest possible extent or practicable extent. And if feasible, the detaining party is supposed to provide medical facilities with respirators, oxygen tanks, and other equipment used to address um, COVID-19 cases. Um, and should organize medical examinations to ensure the health of the detainees and ideally to restrict the spread of COVID-19. Um, they should ensure detention facilities are large enough for social distancing and that there's basic protective equipment. Um, and uh, detainees in a NIAC context should be given access to the same protections as a civilian population, including access to vaccination. Um, so if the civilian population is being provided 
um, vaccines, then the detainee population, even if they're detainees in the NIAC, should be um, provided the vaccine as well. Um, as an IX, humanitarian um, organizations can offer their services. So a group like the ICRC can offer its services and a detaining party is not necessarily obligated to accept it, but they are unless they can um, meet the health needs of detainees on their own, which in non-national armed conflicts is often um, a difficulty, uh, for, particularly for the non-state parties that are, that are holding detainees. Um, now, just uh, to give an example of this, um, we have run into the problem that um, on Guantanamo, um, the US is holding a number of detainees um, and um, was originally planning on giving the vaccine to detainees on Guantanamo and then came under some political pressure to revoke that plan. And on January 31st, they announced that they were no longer going to be providing vaccines to um, prisoners being held in Guantanamo. Um, I wrote um, a piece together with Ryan Goodman and Steve Vladek, um, arguing that that was in violation of international humanitarian law, otherwise um, known as law of armed conflict, um, arguing that under um, international humanitarian law, detainees, these are um, in this case, detainees in a non-international armed conflict are entitled to access to vaccine equivalent to um, access that's being provided to the civilian population and that particularly there's even an argument that they may be entitled to greater access because they're being held in the congregate setting where once one member um, uh, has it, um, given that it's an airborne illness, um, it's higher in likelihood that um, the others would get it. And in fact, prisons um, detention facilities have been a very common um, way in which COVID-19 has spread um, rapidly through populations. Moreover, the detainees on Guantanamo are, um, many of them are elderly and so would have qualified early on if they were being held to similar standards um, that civilians in the US general population are being held for access to vaccines. Um, but, uh, but unfortunately, um, they have stuck to that um, position that they are not going to be providing vaccines to um, Guantanamo, to, to the 40 remaining detainees on Guantanamo, even though at this point they have um, been vaccinating for quite a while. So this is Carol Rosenberg, who's um, one of probably the um, leading um, news analyst, um, a reporter working at Guantanamo. Um, and she reported pretty recently that about a third of the troops and residents at Guantanamo Bay were fully vaccinated, meaning they'd received um, both of their shots, um, and um, and yet they still are planning, uh, have not announced when or whether they are going to be offering uh, the prisoners at Guantanamo um, vaccine shots. And that's despite the fact that the U.S. is obviously um, uh, capable of providing those vaccines and is providing those vaccines to people working on the base and to civilians um, on Guantanamo Bay. Um, so with that, um, let me stop there and see what questions you all have, because um, there's a lot to talk about here, and um, I'm happy to dig into any, any piece of this. Thank you so much, Professor Hathaway, um, for that incredible presentation. Um, we are so grateful to have you here. I personally was really fascinated by your articles when they came out. I'm really happy that you agreed to come talk to us today so that we could all benefit from your expertise. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, for everyone else, my name is Kimia Katibi and I'm an intern with the American Red Cross's um, IHL team at National Headquarters and I'll be acting as today's discussant. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll read them out loud to Professor Hathaway. And if we run out of time, we'll make sure to put an email in the chat so that you can um, forward your questions to her later on. Um, so I'll start out and ask the first question and then open it up to the audience. Um, I was just going to ask, you know, in your legal and scholarly opinion, do you think that given over what's happened this past year with COVID that IHL is going to have to in, uh, evolve to include more specificity for protections during pandemics? And is there, you know, potential maybe for an IHL treaty that addresses these protections or for other large health crises in the future? That's a fantastic question. Um, and I see that there was a little confusion. I'm sorry, I spoke quickly. Um, and so if I, if I wasn't clear when I said IHL, I meant international humanitarian law. So that is the law that governs 
during armed conflict. Um, it's the law that governs the behavior of belligerents um, during armed conflict. So once a war has gotten going, what are the rules that govern the behavior of the warring parties? Um, and so it covers things like what are the rules for who you can target and you have to distinguish between civilians and, um, and military targets, for instance. And if you're going to take a shot on, um, on a military target, but there's gonna be a number of civilians that are begin going to be killed in the process, what are the ways in which you weigh those against one another? So those are, those are the rules that I was talking about. There is, um, um, as I mentioned at the very outset for those who are here, um, there is also a set of questions around in how human rights law separately is affected by the pandemic. And um, there's a lot to be said there as well. So if anyone wants to talk about human rights law, um, which is a separate body of law, although in many cases overlapping with international humanitarian law, some of the obligations of these two bodies of law um, are very similar um, and sometimes even identical. For instance, the prohibition on torture appears in both international humanitarian law and international human rights law. So to your question, Camille, which is an excellent one, is, you know, do we need more rules? Do we need better rules? Do we need more extensive rules to help us understand how um, combatants should operate in a um, armed conflict um, so that the next time we face a situation like this, a potential pandemic, we have a much clearer idea of what those rules might be, do we need, for instance, even perhaps a sort of new optional protocol to address these problems? And I think what, what um, the conclusion that my co-authors and I came to in looking at this issue was that across the board in every area of international law that we looked at, we were really struck by the fact that no one had really spent a lot of time in advance thinking through what happens if we have a global pandemic? And how does that going to affect our legal obligations in a whole host of situations? And so when the global pandemic happened and everything is getting shut down and everyone's in chaos, no one had really sort of thought through in advance what those rules were going to be. And that meant everybody was really confused and unsure about the right answers um, to these kinds of questions like, does it affect our proportionality analysis when we're determining whether to take a strike? Like, should we think differently about, um, about um, strikes that might have an impact on, um, maybe not on medical facilities, but it has, we know there's a warehouse that has, um, that has masks in it. Like, does that change our, does that change our assessment of the, of the legality of this strike, knowing that it's going to affect the ability to disseminate um, really important protective equipment. And nobody had really fully thought these questions through. I, I came to the conclusion that we don't necessarily um, need new rules in IHL. I think we do need some new rules when it comes to the World Health Organization. I think what this revealed is that the international health regulations are way too weak. Um, and there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, progress that needs to be made in terms of um, uh, more mandatory reporting requirements, um, clearer rules about travel restrictions, um, uh, a, a, a general fund that the WHO has to respond quickly to pandemics because it doesn't really have much of a general fund that it can spend money out of. So that that's, I do think that there's international law changes we need to make in that context. But in IHL and international humanitarian law, I'm not sure we need new rules, but what I think we do need is a clearer view about how the rules that we have apply in a pandemic. And, and our article um, and the work that we've started to do here is a beginning to that process. I don't think it's the end of the process. I am hoping that people will come along and look what we've done and try to think it through even further and think through down to specifics. You know, how does this affect what the ICRC is gonna do going forward? Like, how does it affect the ICRC's response in the course of a pandemic? What kinds of guidance should the ICRC be providing to states and non-state actors that have detainees about what their obligations are and being ready to go. Because I do think one thing that we're also hearing is that while this is a one, once in a century pandemic, 
we might be facing more once in a century pandemics in the future. Um, and that there's reason to think that um, we're vulnerable to these kinds of global pandemics um, coming down the road. And we shouldn't assume that we're sort of in the clear for another hundred years. Um, we should actually be thinking ahead as you just did to what happens if this happens again and how can we be prepared beforehand so that we aren't as we were this time kind of caught behind in terms of thinking through the legal rules and regulations and providing guidance to states who are engaged in military conflict about what their legal obligations are. So that's that's where I am on this. Um, I don't think we need new legal obligations, but we need greater clarity about how the existing legal obligations are affected by the pandemic. And, and again, our work is a, is a first step in that direction, but not the last. Great, thank you so much for that answer. And yeah, I mean, this is, you know, the first of I'm sure more pandemics in the future. So it's definitely great to be prepared and ahead of it. Um, with that said, I'll open it up to the audience. We have some ch uh, questions in the chat already. Um, so one of the first ones, which I think you might have uh, seen, well, actually, let's see. So here, so one person asked um, that you said access can't be denied to humanitarian organizations. What if Hamas asserts it's an aid organization that the occupied territories of the West Bank aren't getting adequate COVID-19 treatment, such as vaccines, from the occupying power in the um, OPT and offers to provide vaccines and other treatments? Can Israel deny access? Can the occupying power assert it doesn't need help, even if it does? Can the occupying power second judge who is an aid agency? That's, those are great questions. Um, uh, no surprise um, that uh, uh, Ron Bettauer, who is an, uh, himself one of the leading lawyers in this field, um, uh, is the one asking the question. So um, I think that those are really challenging questions. What I would say is particularly the question about who is a humanitarian aid organization is not a question that's unique to a pandemic. Um, so that is a question that is true, generally speaking, to, to the question of humanitarian access um, and to this issue of kind of who is it that legally is obligated to be given access by occupying powers um, and who counts as a humanitarian organization. And I think that this points to a, a, a area of lack of clarity in the law where it's not always entirely clear. We certainly can say the ICRC is clearly an aid organization, um, the Red Crescent, is clearly a humanitarian aid organization. Um, what about other groups or organizations that represent themselves as aid organizations? Um, uh, do they count or not? And how do we assess that? And to be honest, that the law is not entirely clear on this question. I think many would argue that Hamas as an organization, while part of what it does is provide humanitarian aid, there's no question about that. Um, it provides a, a wide range of other um, it engages in a wide range of other activities, and therefore, um, I would at least um, argue that Hamas writ large um, is, is not one that needs to be given access, um, but, but one might have a harder question if there's, for instance, a humanitarian arm or group um, within it that is seeking access, and how do you assess that? And, and I will say, Part of what I find so interesting about the pandemic is it exposes some of these areas of uncertainty that already exist in international humanitarian law. Um, and, that, um, and that gives us another reason to ask these questions, which again, we should already have been asking because the same question comes up, for instance, in Yemen in the course of um, the cholera epidemic. Um, uh, we've got massive, um, uh, a humanitarian crisis going on, which has nothing to, co to do with COVID-19. It's the worst cholera epidemic um, in modern history in Yemen. And that has raised all kinds of questions around what groups can and should be provided access to address the cholera epidemic. Now, for the most part, the groups that are seeking to do that are groups that everyone would agree are humanitarian organizations. So one of the leading ones has been uh, Médecins Sans Frontières that's provided that, um, that, that has been working um, in Yemen. Um, but, uh, and the bigger question there is not so much who is the aid organization, but who can the aid organizations work with? Um, and the, the Trump administration's designation of the Houthis as a foreign terrorist organization, and it was complicating the delivery of aid, 
into Houthi-held areas of Yemen, both cholera, epidemic address aid, food aid, and COVID um, aid, all kinds of humanitarian aid that are needed there um, because um, there, are, there are US laws prohibiting um, groups from doing from uh, providing any kind of assistance to terrorist organizations. That has been lifted by the Biden administration, which makes things simpler for delivery, um, uh, but doesn't necessarily um, address the question that Ron has answered, which is I'm sure or that has asked, which I'm sure he knows as well as I do, is 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 a is a difficult one. Um, again, pre-pandemic and continues to be a difficult one post-pandemic. Um, uh, and then the question of um, uh, can an occupying power assert it doesn't need help even if it does? Um, that question I think is, um, you know, that is one I do think that a group, if it really does need help, is legally obligated to, um, to agree to that help. Um, if it continues to not agree to that help, the humanitarian group is stuck. Um, so it can't um, insist on access, but the, the occupying power that's not agreeing to the humanitarian assistance um, that is not itself able to provide adequate humanitarian assistance is in violation of its legal obligations as a result. Great, thank you. Another question um, from the audience was, what are the legal requirements for non-state actors or non-state armed groups that are de in de facto control of the state or territories in the state? So can you repeat that? Sorry. Sure. Um, it was, what are the legal requirements for non-state actors or non-state armed groups that are in de facto control um, of the state or territories in the state? I see. So, so the, the same rules apply to them, which is um, they also have the obligation to ensure um, access, humanitarian access, and minimum humanitarian and COVID response needs, right? So if a non-state actor group um, controls a territory, um, it has obligations um, uh, to, um, if a humanitarian group um, offers um, to provide humanitarian assistance, and if that group itself is not capable of providing the minimum humanitarian assistance, then that non-state actor group is required to agree to um, allow access to the humanitarian group and not to interfere with its provision of me medical aid um, and assistance. Um, and um, yeah, so those are, those are obligations that apply to non-state actor groups as well. Um, so humanitarian access is an obligation that applies both in the course of international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict, which means it applies both to states and to non-state actor groups um, that are involved in the conflict. So um, many of those, and we in the article more clearly separate out than I am here between the obligations that apply in the course of an international armed conflict, that is an armed conflict between states and non-state actors, and a um, conflict uh, between a non-state actor group and, an, and a state or between two non-state actor groups referred to as a uh, non-international uh, non armed conflict. Um, and the rules are different. Um, they tend to be less capacious for a NIAC than they are for an IAC, the international armed conflict, um, but there still are significant um, minimal obligations even in a non-international armed conflict. Great. We had um, two questions in the chat that were kind of similar, so I was going to combine them. Uh, basically, you know, the curiosity around how much do belligerent powers actually adhere to IHL during conflicts in practice? Yeah, that's a general problem, right? I mean, again, this is part of what I find so interesting at think about, uh, uh, about thinking about pandemic response is, again, that it, it brings to light problems that are not true just during a pandemic, but are true um, uh, outside of pandemics as well. And this is a problem that we experience um, all the time, that, um, that international humanitarian law is not always perfectly observed. Um, and it is well observed, generally speaking. So every state is a party to the Geneva Conventions, which are the core legal um, treaties that create the central obligations on states. And that creates obligations on states in international armed conflict and also has some minimum rules um, that govern non-international armed conflicts. Um, I would say states um, vary in terms of their, um, uh, their compliance with those legal rules. 
on the whole, for instance, the United States is, is quite good in its adherence to um, international humanitarian law. But we've seen, for instance, just look at um, Russian strikes in Syria during the Syrian conflict, um, which have been massive violations of international humanitarian law, huge civilian um, casualties, um, intentional targeting of military facilities, which is clearly in violation of international humanitarian law. So really tragic um, international humanitarian law violations. Same thing happening, unfortunately, in Yemen, the Saudi-led coalition, which the United States has provided support to, has also engaged in terrible international humanitarian law violations as found by a, a UN um, a body that in, has investigated um, international humanitarian law violations over the course of that conflict and has found quite a number of really troubling IHL violations. And this is again, far preceding the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is not just a COVID-19 pandemic problem. This is what the ICRC exists to try and address. I mean, this is a key part of the mission um, of, the, um, of the ICRC is both trying to get states and non-state actor groups to abide by their IHL violation, their IHL obligations and making sure that they understand what those obligations are um, and clarifying those obligations because there have been um, instances, particularly where non-state actor groups don't fully understand that they too are obligated to abide by minimum um, uh, protections for civilians, for instance, and in the course of uh, combat that there are certain minimum standards that they are obligated to abide by as well. And so part of a mission of a group like the ICRC is to try and clarify those rules and encourage both states and non-state actor groups to abide by them. But um, that project remains as important as it is precisely because states are not, and non-state actor groups in particular, are not always great um, about abiding by their legal obligations. Um, there are obviously ways in which those can be enforced. Um, so enforcement um, is done through war crimes prosecutions. Um, and war crimes prosecutions can happen both um, in um, international court settings. So the International uh, Criminal Court is one place in which um, war crimes can be prosecuted. The US is not a party to the ICC. Um, and so it, um, uh, it cannot be brought before the ICC unless uh, it has committed its crimes in an ICC state party's territory, which is actually alleged to have happened in Afghanistan. Um, and so there is an ongoing investigation of US um, activities in Afghanistan during the Afghan war, not just the Afghanistan, not just uh, US, but all of the parties to the Afghan conflict. Um, and then there's domestic prosecutions um, as well of, of um, war crimes. Um, and so states are obligated to investigate um, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and to prosecute them. Um, and so states are obligated to, to engage in um, enforcement against their own forces, um, as well as the forces of others if they're within their jurisdiction. Um, so there are rules for how to enforce these, these um, obligations, but are they perfectly observed? No, um, they're not. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, you know, that continues to be an ongoing project that many of us are committed to, to trying to, to improve. Um, and that, another question was, what is your view on the UN Security Council resolution on a global ceasefire? Yeah, so for those who have not, um, who've not seen this, there was an effort to um, get uh, warring parties to agree to a ceasefire fire during the pandemic um, on the theory that um, carrying on conflict in the course of a pandemic um, increases risk, um, not only to parties um, to the conflict, but to civilians in conflict regions. Um, and a call initially by the Se Secretary General on states um, to cease hostilities in the course of the pandemic. Um, and, and then that um, was also brought before the Security Council. Um, and unfortunately, um, it has not um, gained a lot of purchase with warring parties. Um, the conflicts may have slowed down for a very short period of time while everybody was sort of going into hibernation for the pandemic. Um, but unfortunately, fighting doesn't seem to have really slowed in any significant way and conflicts have continued um, apace. And so unfortunately, I think there was a kind of hopeful moment there 
that maybe there would be a possibility of using this as an opportunity to push pause on some of these conflicts and maybe even find peaceful resolution to some of these conflicts. And unfortunately, that has not um, proven successful. Um, and there, there hasn't been a kind of appreciable effect um, on, on these conflicts, um, which have continued to rage. And you know, unfortunately meant that these conflict zones are areas where there continues to be real dangers, not only for combatants, but for civilians, which obviously in the midst of a conflict, it's much harder to get access to minimum um, uh, protection, um, as well as obviously the other minimum needs for uh, food and shelter and other kinds of survival. Um, so yeah, it's been a real unfortunate um, failure to be able to succeed in, in bringing about that, that pause in conflicts, which I wish had been successful and it was a it was a good try, but unfortunately didn't seem to to um, to take off. Um, OK, the next question was if a humanitarian organization offers aid for detainees and the detaining party rejects it, in that case, who is responsible for ensuring that the party is actually capable of providing aid themselves? What are some practical ways to make sure that the detaining party is providing aid to detainees? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I do think that groups like the RC ICRC can be helpful here, uh, both in informing detaining parties as to what their obligations are and to try to mediate um, and, um, and ensure that states understand, particularly if it's a state that's holding detainees, but non-state actors understand what their legal obligations are in terms of providing um, minimum protection to their detainees. Um, uh, obviously, a group like that, uh, the ICRC is not legally obligated to do that, um, but, um, but they are permitted to offer their assistance. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, states and non-state actor groups are not legally required to accept their assistance, but if they are not able to provide the aid themselves, then they are supposed to accept the assistance. Um, I will say that the rules regarding kind of what happens in those instances where a um, state or non-state actor is detaining um, uh, or otherwise um, unable to provide um, minimum protections, humanitarian protections to the population that they're responsible for, and a humanitarian group offers that assistance and they refuse it, kind of what are the rules then? I would say, yet yeah, again, this is another one of those areas. Uh, to the extent that there are students on this call, and I understand there's at least a sum, a sum these are great note topics if you're looking for research topics, um, because I don't think these are well, um, well researched, and I don't think we have as much clarity on this as we really ought to. And again, the pandemic is sort of raising the salience level of a lot of these issues, which have been longstanding problems that we haven't really had to um, wrestle with in the same way that we're wrestling with them now. Um, and, and it's a very acute and particular set of concerns here because before we were talking about delivery of PPE, now we're gonna be talking about delivery of vaccines as they become more widely available in the rest of the world. Um, and in the next couple of years available for delivery into um, conflict zones. And there's gonna be a lot of temptation for states and non-state actors to try and limit that access to provide preferential access to areas that are um, held by their supporters um, and to limit access to areas um, that are held by um, civilians that, that support their opponents. Um, and a big um, goal of these organizations, I think is gonna have to be to try and counteract that, both making clear that that's in violation of legal obligations that states and non-state actor groups have and hopefully assisting in that dissemination process of disseminating the vaccines, providing vaccines, helping with distribution, helping with information. Like this is this is the sort of thing that aid organizations um, are, are uniquely well positioned to do, although it also takes a lot of money. And so ultimately it's gonna have to be states that are, that are playing a significant role in providing the funding and support for these kinds of dissemination efforts. Um, so the next question, this is, you know, kind of a transition to IH um, RL as well. Um, so this one was, how does all of this apply to the immigrants coming into the US illegally at the border? Yeah, so one of the areas that we actually talk about separately in the paper um, is um, immigration law. And one of the issues that we talk about there is obligations that states have to um, immigration detainees. 
Um, and there were some really terrible stories early in the pandemic. Um, I don't know, some of you may have seen, there was a really powerful story in the New Yorker about a man who was being held in immigration detention um, and very vivid stories about how immigration detention, at least the detention facilities that he was being held in were doing a terrible job of um, providing basic protective gear to detainees, of providing san minimum sanitation, and most importantly, of um, quarantining those who are clearly COVID positive away from those who are COVID negative. Um, and, um, and moreover, they were um, taking people from facilities where COVID was widespread and transferring them to facilities where COVID had yet not arrived and therefore obviously spreading COVID from uh, one detention facility to another um, and not providing people with sort of minimum protective equipment or you know, masks or anything that they could use to protect themselves um, from getting COVID. And the man that this um, story in the New Yorker was written about um, did in fact develop COVID. Um, he, did, he did survive it, but, um, but a lot of people didn't. Um, and uh, that, you know, in the early, early days when people didn't understand how COVID spread, there's a certain amount of this that one can say, well, you know, they just didn't understand what they were dealing with. But as time went on, it became clearer that we knew that it was airborne spread and that you needed to provide masks. And there was not adequate provision of these kinds of basic protective gear. Um, that is, um, that is uh, in our view, um, in violation of the sort of minimum obligations that states have to um, people who are seeking asylum within the state and who are in, in, in immigration detention, which requires that you provide minimum medical um, aid. And in particular, that you not um, intentionally expose people to, um, to dangerous medical conditions. And so not intentionally uh, put them in situations where they're likely to be subject to, um, to um, infection from COVID-19. And um, I, I'm actually surprised that this hasn't been a bigger story um, than it has been. Maybe it's just there's so many issues and there's a lot of fatigue around the immigration issue. And this is just one more issue on top of many others um, in the immigration detention context. But, um, but uh, yeah, clearly these rules also apply in immigration detention, not the international humanitarian law rules, but equivalent rules that apply to immigration detention, similar kinds of obligations which are pretty common sense obligations. Like don't intentionally expose somebody to a pandemic if you can help it, <laughs> you know, boiled down to like pretty basic rules. Um, and unfortunately those basic rules have not always been observed, not just obviously the United States, which we know well, and I feel a particular responsibility um, to kind of holding to our own best, um, to our own best uh, uh, values. Um, and legal obligations, um, but all around the world, this has become a problem in immigration and detention facilities. And as it continues to spread around the world, this is gonna become more and more of a problem because you have refugees um, in situations where sanitation is pretty minimal, um, access to water is not great. Um, people are already not, not entirely healthy and therefore much more vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic um, and don't have kind of minimal uh, medical um, uh, equipment to protect themselves um, from COVID. So just minimum access to masks um, is, is, is difficult to, to get in some of these facilities. So I'm actually kind of surprised that we haven't seen that as, as a greater source of, of COVID-19 um, infection. Um, uh, although it may be that it has been and we just haven't heard a great deal about it. We know that it spread pretty heavily. It, it, the US in the United States, one of the um, most heavily hit populations um, are prison populations. Um, and we have to expect the same thing is likely true within um, immigration facilities. And to the extent that we have evidence about that, we know that it's true. Therefore, we think it's probably likely true elsewhere, but we don't always have perfect information about that. But yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, and you're right to point to it. Thank you. Um, we have another question that is, how does IHL and IHRL apply to China's treatment of the Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in Xinjiang and the minority populations in occupied Tibet? That is, that's a big question. <laughs> um, so there I would say um, it is um, not so much international humanitarian law because we're not talking in the context of a conflict. 
um, it is much more international human rights law and the international human rights law is what applies uh, generally speaking to states um, treatment of their own citizens. Um, so um, I, there has been a lot of evidence um, coming out of China um, of, of genocide, genocidal behavior, minimum um, or violations of international um, uh, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, violation of the Genocide Convention. I mean, there's a lot of, of human rights violations taking place, totally separate from the COVID-19 pandemic, of course. Um, uh, and yeah, those are, are immensely um, horrific issues, unfortunately, um, uh, separate and apart from the issues we're mainly focusing on today, which is issues related to conflict um, and international humanitarian law. But yeah, absolutely, those are, those are really pressing, dangerous um, and terrible conditions. And I, I think, again, it's something where we have, um, we've, we're getting more and more information out about what's happening. Um, and, um, and the US has been playing some role in this, but obviously it's, it's challenged by the fact that it's a, it's a um, delicate geopolitical situation. So that, but I wholeheartedly endorse the position that what's happening is, is absolutely tragic and a clear violation of international law. And I think there's zero question about that. Uh, another question we got is, what is the scope of armed groups' right of control with respect to humanitarian access? For what purposes? Yeah, so, um, so humanitarian access uh, under the Geneva Conventions um, and international humanitarian law, um, any belligerent force is required to provide basic humanitarian access. Um, and that applies to all belligerents. Um, so it applies to non-state actor groups, it applies to state actor groups, and that includes things like you're not supposed to interfere with or target medical facilities or med people attempting to provide medical um, treatment um, that you're supposed to um, provide and assist with humanitarian access, again, unless you yourself can provide that access. And that applies to all actors. So it doesn't matter so much the condition. I mean, there's, there's variance in terms of the particular rules that apply in particular contexts. Um, and it, it slots in under different provisions of the Geneva Conventions and the optional protocols or the additional protocols. But, um, but the basic rule is a fairly common sense one, which is you're supposed to allow for medical um, access uh, for treatment and for prevention of significant medical um, uh, harm. And really this goes to the core of where international humanitarian law started. So inter international humanitarian law really started with the idea that once um, soldiers were rendered or to combat, that is they're wounded, they can't fight anymore, uh, they're good. laying on the battlefield, um, that You're there loud. should- On the battlefield. To, uh, oh, thank you, somebody muted our friend. Um, uh, that um, that, uh, that um, when somebody's wounded and no longer able to fight, that um, there should be medical treatment provided to them, regardless of what which side they're on, and that they should be um, uh, provided basic treatment. And that was the core idea of, that's how this all got started. That was the sort of basics of um, the insight of international humanitarian law was um, if somebody no longer can fight, then they should um, have access to basic medical care, that we should provide minimum treatment to these folks, that they should not be left to die and suffer on the battlefield. And so the ideas that we're talking about in the course of pandemic, I think really go back to the core um, insight of, um, of this body of law, which is um, that you know, human beings' basic minimum rights need to be respected even in a war. Um, and that like the, the will, ability to be protected from a pandemic and to receive basic medical care in the course of a pandemic and have the capacity to be protected from harm um, if doing so um, is requires relatively minimal effort from the warring parties is, is obviously not only a good idea, but legally obligated, they're legal, legally obligated to do so. Um, and that really goes to the kind of core insights of international humanitarian laws, even more trying to kill each other, um, even more in the, in the midst of a war, um, there's certain basic human um, dignity, there's basic human dignity that we want to protect and being able to be, um, have minimum access to medical care is one of those pretty widely agreed on rules. Um, 
And, and in a pandemic, the issue is it's not just the wounded, it's all of us who are potentially at risk. It's also the case, I think, that I, I am trying to make the case for our thinking about providing these um, access to medical care to people in the course of conflict. One has to realize that um, providing vaccines and access to, um, to PPE and the like to people in the course of conflict is not just good for the people you're providing access to, it's good for everybody, right? Because it's not good for anyone if the pandemic is allowed to run rampant. Um, the more the pandemic spreads, the more infections occur, um, the more likelihood that there is that there will be new variants, the more likelihood that those variants are going to come back and hit the rest of us, the more likely it is that civilians who have nothing to do with the conflict are going to be um, affected by that pandemic. There's no containing it. Um, a, an airborne illness like COVID-19 is one that none of us um, are really safe from. I mean, we can do our best to protect ourselves from it, but particularly in conflict zones, it is going to escape and it's going to not just affect the party that you're fighting against, but it's ultimately gonna affect your own fighters as well. Um, and so one of the ways in which one can make a case for um, two belligerent parties to say like, let us in, let us provide this basic access, let's, let us vaccinate the civilian population, even if they're a civilian population that supports the other side, um, is that doing so is in everybody's best interests um, because ultimately, those harms are going to affect the entire population. Um, and you're not going to be able to prevent it from affecting you know, the people that you care about to prevent, pre from affecting your own warring uh, forces. Um, and so, you know, again, this goes back to the core idea of international humanitarian law. It's like the one thing that we can all agree on is that basic medical treatment that is necessary to prevent human suffering should be provided even when we're trying to kill each other, which is, um, what a war really is. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I think that this like helps us come back to the thing that is core to this body of law and core to the insights um, that led to this body of law and core to the creation of, of the ICRC, which is really about trying to address exactly this problem. Thank you so much. Um, that brings us to our time for today. Again, thank you, Professor Hathaway, for making the time to come and speak to us. Um, if your questions were unanswered, there is an email in the chat that you can direct your questions to. Um, and a recording of this will also be shared on our Rules of War website. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.